asking, regardless of what you're using. So if you take nothing else from today, except or from this whole experience, except those three dimensions, that is your color space, that is your color world that you're working within, regardless of what color wheel you end up using. Okay? Any questions? And for you newbies, I know, I'm like going 100 miles an hour. So if you have a question, don't be intimidated. It's if anyone else that's been here has a question, I might make a fool out of you. You should know this by now. Yeah. Any questions at this point? Okay. All right. That's the color wheel we're working with. Right? And that's what this guy, Riley, and my teacher, Michael, took this kind of this very structured thing and ran with it. Right? Because before this, again, I've got all the old treatises. You talk about colors, and they'll tell you for a flesh pal, you lay out tints of light ochre, you lay out tints of this. But it was vague enough that if you weren't sitting with that master, then I don't know how many they need to lay out. I don't know what those tints look like. You know, are they light or dark? Like, what is their consideration of what a dark tint is? It's all vague. Now, we've got specific language. Okay, that's the language. Now we get on to, why are we here? Everyone else has been here for the, for the, the, uh, the uh, still life. So we've, we've had this discussion about applying the color wheel to things that are in front of you. But we're here for a very specific purpose, and it's about flesh. Okay? If I, when I title this lecture, uh, the, the lecture is called Painting Orange. And the lecture is called Painting Orange because the entire history of flesh painting revolves around one fundamental act. It's the, uh, someone trying to mix an orange that matches the person that's in front of them. And why is that? Because all human complexions, regardless of where anyone comes from, all human complexions are fundamentally orange. And if anyone says yellow red, like I said, I'm going to bounce you out the door. <laughs> all human complexions are fundamentally orange. That is a fundamental base. Now, I'm not, don't ask me questions about colored light. Colored light, we'll get into that, but that's irrelevant. The fact is, the skin bag, right? And you ladies, I'm sorry. If I call you a skin bag at some point today, it's not to insult you. We are all skin bags. The dermis, right? The organ. When you strip this from the body, this is orange. That is what its local is. Now, the only difference is, is it a light orange? Is it a medium orange? Is it a dark orange? Depending on where you come from, depends on what the value is. But the hue is fairly consistent. The only reason I say fairly is depending again on where you come from. You might be an orange that leans towards red. You might be an orange that leans towards yellow. But fundamentally the basic complexion of every person is in that orange range with little variations. Okay? Very important to understand that. And for all the, you know, the, the understanding I thought I had about that uh, it, it really uh, 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 settled in on me when I found a book um, this early part of the 20th century and, and th this person put together like 300 years of flesh palettes from European to European schools and he actually had it like, like I guess he went and researched and looked at like self-portraits and went through treatises he had all these nice little diagrams like drawn with the palettes and showing what colors he used and about three quarters of the way into the book, I realized, although it was never said, that every one of these palette arrangements is all about making an orange in some way, shape, or form. This was this, the, uh, the German school might have used these pigments, the Italian school might have used these pigments, they might have started with this underpainting or that underpainting, but again, the end result was everyone is trying to mix something that's orange, whether you do it directly, whether you glaze for it, because we're not Martians. I mean, we all have to come to that same conclusion that I'm getting some type of an orange that has areas that are red, that has areas of yellow. That's the end result. So every palette, and I'm saying this, I'm like the, the magician that likes to, you know, give the secrets, so, you know, mystify. You can go to any lecture from now on and hear people talk about all their complex ways of making flesh. While they're talking about all these esoteric ways, you can be thinking, yeah, I know, you're just trying to make orange. Like, let's get over it. It's like, not that complicated. Uh, okay, so when we deal with a complexion, it's very important to keep something in mind. Because looking at anyone across the room, 
you might look and think, well, I'm looking at he or she and, and I'm seeing red. I mean, I'm seeing this or that. Very important that we understand what the complexion is. When we deal with the complexion, what are we dealing with? We're dealing with the local of the skin. I go back to, if we were to get par movie and flay the skin, if you were to take the skin bag off, this has an actual color to it. And how do you know what the actual color is? If you squeeze, now I'm a little tan, a little bronze, so I'm getting a little different read today. If you squeeze your skin so that all the blood comes out of it, what's left? I'm looking at the skin bag, right? The problem and the complexity of flesh, and this is where some of the esoteric mixing comes in. The problem everyone has with flesh is, this is not an opaque thing, right? So even though this has a certain hue value in chroma, it is orange at a certain value, at a certain degree of intensity. The problem is, this is influenced by everything that's under it. It's a semi-opaque covering. So it's not like when you guys are in the still life, that if you have, you've assessed that I have that cone, and that cone is purple-blue, and it's a certain value, and a certain chroma, I just have to get my purple-blue out and I can paint it. Not the case here. The fundamental root of our flesh palette, of our understanding of, of doing the portrait of the flesh, is knowing that this is orange, basically, but then we have to account for all the things that are happening to this that make that orange shift all over the map. Right? That's the difficult thing. But it's, under, it's important to understand what the, when we talk about the complexion, we're not talking about the reddest area, right? Which on human beings, typically, as you move out from the center, the appendages get redder. We're not talking about the yellowest area. The yellowest areas of the flesh are typically where there's subcutaneous bone, right? Where the flesh is being stretched to the point where there's very little blood. So we're trying to find an average for the particular person. And typically, just to throw this out, you know, I mean, usually if you're looking at the full body, the best place to get a read of someone's actual flesh complexion, local, is right around the solar plexus, right around here. You've got the thickest area of flesh, you have the least amount of the capillary action where you've got all the blood vessels in the fingers. So when you're looking at the figure, usually the best place to take a read of someone's actual complexion, like where do they fall on the scale of orange? Are they orange leaning to red? Are they orange leaning to yellow? Are they light orange? It's usually right around here. On the portrait, it's right around here. Right? And why is that? What happens if we go up here? That's That's good. good. I mean, it, it, you're, it, it has something to do with the orientation, but let's say it, uh, it's, it's the forehead. But even in the forehead, why would I not look up here near my scalp, near my hairline? What's that? Well, I'm, 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 I'm trying to filter through it, but there's light, but what was it? I think it was a light. It, it is it's true, but it's more important that when I'm trying to see someone's complexion, it, it has something else to do with it. It's the angle, but what, what typically... How do I phrase this? Well, it, usually on most people, the, the skin starts to get redder up here. Why is that? This is the area that's always facing the sun. Yeah. So I mean, again, it depends on the part of the year, but you know, usually if you're and, and well, let, let's let's hold off there. Let, let's let's go back to why is this usually the best area? Well, within the given forehead, the further this moves up towards the hairline, the more likely you're going to have some you know influence of the sun. Same thing with the body. Like even from here, what happens as you even move up higher on the trunk towards the neck? Again, you have the same thing. I mean, this is usually the area facing the sun, so typically you'll see you know, people get a little redder in here. Why is it not through here? From ear to ear, why are you not able to get a good sense of someone's actual complexion? Doesn't mean these things aren't important, that you recognize certain things are going on, but when you're thinking about where is someone's complexion to be found, why is it not through here? Anywhere. It's kind of a reddish area anyway. That's right. It's called you a, have a lot of blood vessels and things. It's called a thank you, Lee, It's called a ruddy band. That's right. That from ear to ear is where typically you find the reddest areas in the face: ears, nostrils, cheeks. This is typically where you have the you know you'll see someone get flushed. So this is not a good place to get a read of someone's actual skin. And why not down here, particularly on men? <laughs> not on women. Don't say that on women. Like that. It's weaker in intensity because of what? 
That's right. So, so this, and as far as the head, the best place to get a read is usually right around here. Well, I'm wondering too, this area, and a lot of paintings looks greenish. You get purples in there. Yeah. But obviously with men, it's even but more why, why, is it, why, why is that? Is that just because it's farther away from the light? I, th I think it, light? it has to do with the hair as much as yeah, the placement under. And it might just be around, like you've got a, a bunch of series of changing forms here. Well, think about it. Again, the forehead, like I mentioned, if, if I reference my knuckle as a place where the skin is pulled tightly, you have very little things influencing it, so you can actually see the skin color. Same thing here. When you get down here, you got meat down here. Maybe so, I mean, it's a combination, I think, of hair and other things. But again, when looking to try to assess someone's local, I mean, this is really the best place to do it. Uh, okay, so it's important then to, uh, to recognize uh, what, when we talk about the local, what we're talking about. Because invariably, I've done it long enough to get that question comes up. Well, what about here? That doesn't look like orange. It looks like red or blue or red. Yes, there are very specific areas to take that read. And the other thing is, Riley used to say, if you stand 20 yards back from someone and look at them and squint your eyes, that's their local, that's their complexion. You're not going to see all those little bits of red or all those little bits of green. So, and that's the whole purpose for those who have been here uh, and those who haven't. That's, that's one of the functions when you're painting of squinting until your eyes are almost closed. The, the, the act of squinting gets rid of the extremities. It gets rid of the lightest values, the darkest values, and the, the, the most chromatic shifts and the least chromatic shifts, and it leaves you with something that's in the middle that you can then use as a place to begin your painting. Okay? Does that make sense? Give me a, give me a time. Quarter of 10? 11? Okay. And see, I forgot, we go to 6. So, I try to get through the shot, or, uh, um, I try to get through this information as fast as possible. We get, and as I said, oceans of time, right? We get all around the world. Okay. The, uh, let me see. So, if we understand what the complexion is,
falls in the same part of the spectrum as cadmium orange. So does that make sense? So each one of these, like we're picking two colors off the rack, that, that they're, they're similar in terms of where they fall in the wheel. So we're not just grabbing colors and putting them together. Like raw umber is here. I could take raw umber and add it to cadmium orange and it would darken it, but what would it also do? It would make the orange more yellow. So with each one of these, the way they're constructed, we're trying to keep them as consistent as possible from light to dark in hue. Is there a list? Is there a list of what dark color you mix? Sean has them around here. You say birth over the same wavelength, but less value. It's me. That's correct. And again, you know, the, the, when I first got into the program, I thought, how did someone come up with burnt over? I mean, you know, it's some type of an orange, but how do you calculate that? I come back to they can measure wavelengths now. I mean, you know, and, and that's. If I, for those of you that have been around, you know I said that in the privacy of my studio, I still use a pigment primary system. But after all, you see, I have another level layer of bags under my eyes from all the work I've done preparing for this. I've done so many of these charts now for months sell that I'm actually going to switch in my studio. Because, again, you really, it, this, you can't beat the degree of specificity that this system can get into in terms of cataloging. Doesn't mean it's the best. Like if you use another system, you can't paint. Like you can't make good paintings with another system. But because of the Munsell company being able to measure wavelengths, that we can, for the first time, actually unify our color language. When we talk about burnt umber, it's not a reddish this. It's orange. It's yellow red. It's yellow red. So anyway. But yeah, we'll get you that information. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. So clearly, then, if we look at that. No one in here looks anywhere even close to that. What do we have to do to that spring to get it closer to complexion? Change the chrome. Change the chrome. We have to bring the chrome in. Now, as I mentioned, this is our chroma chart for <laughs> orange. The outside edge is. I'm sorry if anyone can't see me here. The outside edge of this wave is that string of paint. So at each one of these values, it is as strong in chroma as it can get for that given value. Now, it doesn't mean that a tint is as strong as that. That's why it's set back in the scale. But the point is, I can't go out and buy another tube pigment of orange and at that value, I'm not going to get any stronger in intensity. It just doesn't happen. I mean, cadmium orange is as strong as you're going to get unless you're doing glazing. We're going to talk about that. I'll just mention it for those. Because someone would say, what about glazing? So I've, I've addressed that question. When I make a chroma chart of this, most human beings fall in this range. And I don't mean in this value range. I mean bringing the intensity of that string of orange down, and all I'm adding to that is what? What am I adding to do that in this chart? I'm sorry, like I said, you can't. Does that help if you can see it? Not black and white. Yeah, it's it's right. Black. Right. Neutral, black. Why neutral? But again, for the newbies, why can't I just add black to something? Because black, there are many variations of black, and if they're not neutral, something towards Blues, some towards green, but mostly towards blues. And the way you can check it is if you mix black with other colors, like yellow, you sometimes get a green one. You're going to come up here. I'm already getting hoarse. I think I'm going to pull you up here. <laughs> She's exactly correct. Because black, in theory, is the absence of color, but black, in dirty reality, to black is blue. It's bluish. It certainly is cool to the point where if you mix it with a warm color, you're going to get a reaction, right? So when these charts are created, I'm using a neutral gray. It is a black that has something added to it to totally neutralize it. What do I mean by neutralize? So that black does not favor either the warm part of the spectrum or the cool part of the spectrum. For those, now we're using the Williamsburg grays which have been neutralized, but for those who have been here, what two things that I recommend adding to black? Either this or this to neutralize it. Alina Quan. Umber. Either raw umber or, or the other one I forget, so help me out, guys. 
It's either burn or raw umber will help you do that. If, and I gave, and anyone who doesn't have the formula, we can talk about it. But it's the, the neutral then is, is, a, is a pigment, a tube black, that has a certain amount of a warm color mixed into it so that it totally cancels out the bluishness. So that I can take that neutral black and add it to anything, any other hue, and darken that hue or weaken its intensity but not change the hue. Because we don't want to get in a situation where I'm mixing, I'm trying to darken a yellow, and I just grab black, and now all of a sudden I have a green. You know, I, I may not want that. I might, I might not, I might not. So what I'm using here to bring the intensity down are these neutral grays. So that at each level, they are reducing the intensity, but keeping the hue consistent. Okay, you clear on that? Clear as mud? I know for some. I know, I trust me, but you're going to answer. No, no, uh, you, you talked about some Williamsburg. Those are the ones we're using here. Williamsburg is a, is a manufacturer that actually is making neutral grays at various values. Okay, so that is using those grays? That's correct. All right. But you can mix your own neutral with ivory black and either burnt umber or okay. raw. So, back to my point. Uh, the most humans are falling in this range in terms of, you know, if we think about that scale of chroma being intense and weak, you know, most people, most flesh is, is like a medium weak. I mean, it's a lot weaker than I initially would have thought. Like, when I started mixing these charts, you know, when I look at this, this is about where my chroma falls. When I look at that on the chart, I'm thinking, get out of here. That's not, but then... When you look at that, I mean, well, what, what triggered for me, number one, is when I mix up a given value with this chroma and put it on my skin, it disappears. I'm going to do that later. The other thing is I started to realize, and it was, of course, I had to be married to realize this. I started to look at the makeup cases in the bathroom. I thought, yeah, that's, that's, like, that's like makeup. I mean, that, that looks like what was cover up or whatever what I see in the bathroom. Uh, so, I mean, flesh is fairly... Uh, is a fairly weak thing. Now, there are areas that, as I said, are more intense, areas that are less intense, but the local itself is fairly weak. What do we have here? To understand, then, that all flesh is basically orange, all I've done here is show that... Okay. Here's our... Here's our red. There is the yellow. Okay. So we're only in this part of the entire color. We're right in here. Very small part of the color, just to, to really show, have at this point home, how, how specifically or, or how limited the actual range of hue and flesh is. So we're already here. And now we're going even closer to that orange or yellow red. The entire spectrum of human flesh falls right in there. That's it. Don't get any different than that. If you see anyone that's any yellower than that, they got liver problems, right? You see anyone that's redder than that, they've been out in the sun way too long. But that's not the average complexion. Every person, regardless of race, can be found somewhere in here. And usually it's even somewhere between these. But it's in that very limited range. Either light complected people, medium complected people, dark complected people. That's it. And this is even a little higher in chroma. I could have dropped it even a little bit more, but I like to turn it on the high side. The only thing I've done here is to just take this little section and just lay it out so you can look at it a little bit more. So you added neutral grades to this. That's right. Or a little lighter. It's a combination. Yeah, neutral grades. And, you know, I mean, clearly. You know, there are other pigments, as we talked about. You know, th this is really spotlighting 20 primary hues. Now, I know with some of you I mentioned that I went ahead and mixed in between just to do it. So, I mean, we're, we're introducing other tubes of color here where I was using, you know, cadmium orange, which is my typical orange, but then getting cadmium yellow deep, cadmium winter orange, which is like, uh, it's not quite, so it's not quite red as, as red as cadmium light. So I actually pulled out other pigments, but again, the, the, just to hammer home the fact that all complexions really fit in that very narrow range on the color. It doesn't go anywhere else. 
You're not going to see blue people. And, you know, I, I was rehearsing. I'm always in every lecture waiting for the person who's going to try to take the teacher down by asking a question <laughs> that he can't answer. So I'm always like a lawyer thinking, what is someone going to ask? Well, what if they're under blue light, Mr. Carlin? It doesn't change the fact that they're orange. It's just orange that's heavily influenced by blue because of the light, right? Everyone is in this range. It's just a question of where do we go from there? What lighting are they under? What colors are influencing that orange? But this is always our starting point. Read again. Why? Yes. Oh, here it comes. Go ahead. No, I'm Lay on me a little bit. I just want okay, like to ask you if this is all you need as a basic to show light and shadow as well, correct? Right? That's correct. Okay. And that's why it's a starting point. And where we go into now after having this discussion about complexion, and complexion and where it falls on the color wheel, now what? This is all great knowledge, but what do I have to do now? Well, what do I lay out to get this? Right? Well, what am I going to put out on my palette to get this? But that's an excellent question. So, this is, so this is, sorry to go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. So this is without light. No, 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 this is, this is, yes, that's correct. You're, that's correct. Okay. It is without, and it, does everyone understand what Alina's asking? Yes. That's right, because as those of you that have been here before, uh, and for those who haven't, you know, it's, it's one thing to understand what a thing, what's your best determination of what something is. Then you have to figure out, is it being influenced by the color of the light that's around it, right? Because that's going to make it shift in some areas. It's also important to think about, well, what is the color next to it that might be influencing it as well? So it, it's a starting point to understand what a thing actually is, but then the question is, what do I have to add to help in the environment that it's in as well. So that's a good question. So all of this is great information, but the, the question is now, well, how do I translate this into a palette? Right? What am I going to mix out? Any questions up until now? You should be writing down. Right? Ready your questions down? Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, you're good. Yeah. Um.